Welcome to Bird for Joy, a show about discovering all the different ways that bird watching can bring joy into our lives. I'm Candy Lanfite, your gracious host and fledgling birder. Here at Bird for Joy, we focus on listening and watching the birds around us, being curious and learning what the birds have to teach us about joy, life, and ourselves. So grab your favorite beverage, settle on your perch, and let's get into today's episode. Hello, birdieful friends. Welcome back to the Bird for Joy podcast. It's the third week of April. And for those of us living in the Northern Hemisphere, spring is in full swing. The blooms, insects, and birds are abundant. South Central Texas, near the Gulf of Mexico, is located in the Central Flyway. According to the American Bird Conservancy, the Gulf of Mexico coastlines are the first U.S. stop in spring for northbound neotropical migrants. Of course, several other states besides Texas include Gulf shorelines. But birders living in these regions have the unique opportunity to witness an influx of migratory avian species after their long journeys from where they overwintered. Some of these species remain in the coastal regions for their breeding and nesting seasons. Others will continue north to their nesting locations. Migration season is an exciting time for birders, and many areas host bird festivals, birding clubs organize group tours, and some nature centers offer bird walks. These scheduled events offer birders and non-birders opportunities to experience birds, bird bird-related programs, and nature-oriented activities. Because I'm not in communication with any other birders in my area, I normally bird alone. Besides not knowing other birders around me, Other reasons for solo birding are, I can go when it fits into my schedule, I can go as slowly or as quickly as I want, and because of my inattentive ADHD, I am easily distracted. Birding and being out in nature calms and centers me. It is a mindful experience. One, I prefer solitude, so I can listen and connect with the natural world. However, there is a part of me that longs to connect with like-minded birders and to be a part of a community so that we can share knowledge and experiences. So, the first weekend in April, I drove an hour and a half into Houston to join a birding group at the Houston Arboretum and Nature Center for an organized bird walk, my first one. Now, I went without expectations for the outing, save for enjoying the experience. There were two leaders for a group of 12, and binoculars were handed out to those who didn't have a pair. It was suggested the group refer to one of the two leaders because she was more skilled at identification. I thought, it's going to be best to stick close to her since I consider myself a novice. However. The Nature Center is located around the bayou system of Houston, and I kid you not, there were swarms of mosquitoes. So I doubled back toward the group facilitator to borrow some bug repellent he'd offered earlier. Unfortunately, this put me at the tail end of the group. When a bird caught the attention of the head group leader, it was either gone by the time I tiptoed up, or the rest of the group had moved on. Not only did I not see the bird they'd spotted, but I didn't even hear the name of the species. So, after the third bird miss, I switched on my Merlin Bird ID app and began trying to find the birds that I heard. Here's a list of birds. Some I didn't get eyes on, but I heard them. Carolina Wren, Northern Mockingbird, House Wren, Northern Cardinal, Tufted Titmouse, Yellow-throated vireo, mallard duck, American goldfinch, blue-headed vireo, white-eyed vireo, downy woodpecker, 
ruby-crowned kinglet, white-throated sparrow, chipping sparrow, blue jay, dark-eyed junco, red-bellied woodpecker, and a peleated woodpecker. Besides one other woman, the group members were 30 years old or younger, and it seemed as if everyone knew each other as I listened to them chatting. In comfortable situations, I can be extremely outgoing, but if I don't know anyone or I'm feeling vulnerable for any reason, I go into this self-preservation mode and do not interact with others. This was the case for the first 15 minutes of the walk, and I depended on the Merlin ID app and my reflections when it came to observing the birds. By the time I'd missed the second group bird sighting, I managed to catch up with another woman who seemed about my age. We joked about how, for some reason, she and I were missing all the good birds. She'd already attended a couple of the outings with the group. I only wish that I had gotten her contact information before we parted ways that day. I believe that she would make a pretty good birding companion. At the end of the trail, a wooden deck towered over the bayou. While the majority of the group congregated for a few minutes, I heard the loud hammering of a peleated woodpecker. They were a frequent species in my area back home. The woman I had been walking with and I were discussing the depth of the knock, and I was fairly certain it was a peleated and then said it out loud. But the lead organizer corrected me as she walked past and stated that it was a red-bellied woodpecker. Before my brain had time to process, I said, Are you sure? It has such a deep knock. It was an open mouth, insert foot moment. She replied, Nope, it was most definitely a red-bellied woodpecker, and walked away. I turned to my new birding ally, shrugged, and said, Oops, sorry, guess I made a mistake. Not even a minute or two later, as we began our walk back, we heard the distinctive call, of a peleated woodpecker. From the front of the group, the female leader called back, okay, so I was wrong, y'all. Now, I tried not to read too much into her response, and I'm sure she wasn't directing it at me, but I tend to be overly sensitive, and there was something off-putting about the experience. It really wasn't a matter of who was right or wrong, but because she was leading the group, I probably shouldn't have overstepped by questioning her. The highlight of the walk was when the whole group observed several pine warblers high in a pine tree as they'd flit out from a branch to snatch a flying insect. After a full year of solitary birding, this event made me ponder organized bird walks. Would I ever attend another one? Did I fit in? Or should I try looking for another group? Could I have interacted more with the other members during the walk? What if the group's leader had handled the woodpecker ID situation differently? If so, would the feeling that I'd overstep not have occurred? After several days of overthinking and worrying, I finally had to let it go. We can't change the past. We can only move forward and do better. All in all, the experience was a learning opportunity, but I can't really say that I enjoyed myself. I'm not trying to be a negative Nelly. But if you remember from the beginning, my only expectation for the outing was to enjoy the experience. Since I didn't have any other group bird walks to compare to this one, I decided to do some research on organized group birding events. There are a lot of websites and birding clubs that offer suggestions and do's and don'ts while out birding. But I believe the American Birding Association offers the best advice. Now, I've shortened a few of the parts of their birding code of ethics, but made sure to include the main points. I will add a link to the complete code in the show notes. The ABA code of ethics begins with, quote, practice and promote respectful, enjoyable, and thoughtful birding as defined in this code. Number one, respect and promote birds and their environment. 1A. Support the conservation of birds and their habitats. 1B. Avoid stressing birds or exposing them to danger. 
Be particularly cautious around active nests and nesting colonies, roosts, display sites, and feeding sites. Limit the use of recordings and other audio methods of attracting birds. 1C. Always minimize habitat disturbance. Number 2. Respect and promote the birding community and its individual members. 2A. Be an exemplary, ethical role model by following this code and leading by example. Always bird and report with honesty and integrity. 2B. Respect the interests, rights, and skill levels of fellow birders. 2C. Share bird observations freely, providing such reporting would not violate other sections of this code, as birders, ornithologists, and conservationists derive considerable benefit from publicly available bird sightings. 2D. Approach instances of perceived unethical birding behavior with sensitivity and respect. 2E. In group birding situations, promote knowledge by everyone in the group of the practices in this code. Number three, respect and promote the law and rights of others. 3A, never enter private property without the landowner's permission. 3B, familiarize yourself with and follow all laws, rules, and regulations governing activities at your birding location. And then the ABA follows up these codes with birding should be fun and help build a better future for birds, for birders, and for all people. Birds and birding opportunities are shared resources that should be open and accessible to all. And birders should always give back more than they take. After reading the American Birding Association's Code of Ethics, I think the woodpecker ID situation could have been handled differently. I don't want it to have a negative impact when and if I ever go on another group walk. Because I do believe that group birding events can be enriching experiences and great opportunities for birders, new and seasoned, to learn from one another. I feel it's important to mention that we are all unique individuals. We all think, behave, and feel differently. Each person's perception and experience differs from others. We all have our strengths and weaknesses, and we all bring something different to the table or in the birder's case, the field or trail. We are all different, and our differences should be celebrated and respected, not rejected and criticized. I recorded this episode a few weeks ago, and I have been procrastinating posting it. I thought about cutting the experience segment and then only including the research parts. I contemplated trashing the entire episode. Why? because it wasn't packed with bird joy and positivity. I wasn't shouting for them tree chops about how much I loved my first organized bird walk. I feared that you, dear listeners, would discover my thoughts and feelings thinking that I was this judgy person who doesn't like group bird outings. But I'm not judgmental. And it's not that I don't like group bird walks, because I've only been on one. Truth is, I am being honest. And I don't have enough experience to form an opinion or a conclusion about group outings. In the end, I chose to upload the episode without cutting anything. I strive to be transparent with my audience, even when things aren't always sunshine and rainbows. What about you? Have you been on a group bird walk? How was your experience? Do you prefer to bird alone or with a group? If you get a chance, leave me a comment about your thoughts on Instagram at Bird for Joy. You can add your comment on the post regarding this episode. Remember, June will be the first podversary for Bird for Joy and the start of Season 3. I have decided for Season 3 to switch up the format and include some interviews on the show. This means birders, other bird podcasters, bird photographers, artists, bird groups, organizations, authors, or anyone out there who wants to share their birding story or about their spark bird. If you are interested in being on the Bird for Joy podcast, please reach out. You can DM me on Instagram at Bird for Joy. Well, this wraps up today's episode. I hope you all have a birdiful weekend, my friends. 
If you are enjoying the show, I would love it if you would follow or subscribe, rate, review, and then let others know about the podcast so we can continue to build a community of like-minded birders. Until next time, stay chirpy, my friends, and get outside, feel the sun upon your face and the wind in your hair, and bird for joy's sake. Bird for joy's sake, when you're needing more, a new beginning, feeling lost, alone, or blue, go into nature, stroll to the melodious tunes of birdsong, let it refresh your soul, fill your heart, lift your spirits. Yes, bird, for joy's sake, witness the winged wonders flitting, fluttering, playing hide and tweet. Is there anything else so sweet? I think not. Well, save for the chitter chatter of my own nestlings as they filled my early days. But sigh no more, for they have long left the nest, and I now strive to find myself once again, discovering new things that I do best. Bird, for joy's sake, for our feathered friends have much joy to share, and it doesn't cost a dime, only time. And I don't know about you, but I am willing to give, to have a chance to live out my days, filled with curiosity, hope, and wonder, learning patience, the art of slowing down and being fully present, living in the moment, something I have long strived to achieve. Bird, for joy's sake, and keep looking up. Let their constant cheer infect you, their tenacity provide you with lessons of never giving up and looking on the brighter side of life. Prepare for entertainment with their quirky, chirpy silliness. Oh my, so much cuteness, happiness, and whimsy. You can't help but smile. And suddenly, you'll discover worries cease, frustrations fade, chaos calms, and troubles melt away like snow in the spring. You will find yourself looking up and forward into the horizon, Surrounded by song, hope and happiness perched in your heart, feeling renewed and fulfilled. Go out into nature, take a stroll, let the avifauna rejuvenate your soul, and bird for joy's sake.